The Northman is an awesome film for so many different reasons, but what I particularly liked about it was how steeped in the Icelandic sagas and other medieval texts the film really is. Co-writers Robert Eggers and Schoen really understand the medieval story world that all of these different texts take place in. While watching the film, I noticed all of these different allusions to specific texts and larger traditions from the Middle Ages, and I spoke a bit about the Northmen in a previous video. So what I want to do in this video is provide a kind of reading list for people who are interested in the source material for the Northmen. Again, Schoen and Eggers are very much drawing from the medieval literary traditions. And of course, the most prominent or the most obvious source that they're drawing from is Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Denorum. This is where the story of Amleth is told. Just like Shakespeare, Schoen and Eggers are drawing from this medieval history. But Saxo really only provides the broad structure of Amleth's story. And what I really want to focus on in this video is the Old Norse Icelandic sagas, as well as a few different texts from the Old English and Middle English traditions that I think are either directly influencing the Northmen or they work as complementary to the Northmen. And I just think that someone who enjoys the movie The Northmen, they might just enjoy these stories. And I always think that people should go back and read the medieval sources. They're not as foreign as you might think they are. And I'll try to be as brief as possible here. So I'm only picking from a few different texts. Trust me, I know I'm leaving out plenty of sagas. I very much debated on just reading out the list of family sagas for this video, as I think they're all wonderful. As you can tell by my big box set of the family sagas, I think you should read all of them. Um, so many of them are so good. But what I want to focus on here is a select few that not only work as um, a good introduction to this, this medieval literature, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, but they also directly pertain to certain aspects of the film The Northman. And check the description down below for full bibliographic details as well as the editions and translations that I recommend. The first book I recommend is quite obvious. It's the Poetic Edda. This is where we get almost all Norse mythology, or most of Norse mythology. We get it in the two Eddas, the Poetic Edda and then Snorri's Edda, the, the Prose Edda. And this is really where we get all of the stories of the Aesir, the gods, the giants, and that ilk, which is all wonderful. But the reason I'm really talking about the Poetic Edda now is that a lot of people sort of neglect the second half of the Poetic Edda. The first half is all of this mythology where we get we get Vuluspao, we get this description of Ragnarok, we get Havamal, we get the, um, the, the sayings of the kind of wisdom poetry of Othan. But in the second half of the Poetic Edda, we really get all of these heroic poems about these legendary Germanic heroes that crop up all across the early Germanic world in Old English, Old Norse, Middle High German. And these poems are, one, quite good. I mean, they're quite exceptional. But these poems are where I think uh, Schoen and Eggers are really drawing from. And so while I think the mythological poems are worth reading and clearly quite important to the Northmen, I would really recommend reading the Helgi poems or the Niflung poems in the second half of the Edda. And in fact, one of the sagas we'll talk about in just a little bit retells a lot of these poems in, in, in prose, in saga form. But the Poetic Edda is, of course, just a must-read if you want to get into the worldview of these stories. You really can't go wrong. And um, Jackson Crawford's translation is quite good. Highly recommend it. Um, I'd also recommend Carolyn Larrington's translation. But now on to some sagas. The Icelandic sagas are written primarily between the years about 1200 and 1400. Note, this is between 200 and 400 years after Iceland converts to Christianity. That's a very long time. And they're all written in what we call either Old Norse or Old Norse Icelandic. And before even reading the sagas, it's important to realize that just like in modern fiction, there are different genres of saga and different sagas sort of abide by different uh, generic rules and, and traditions. And there are quite a few of these, but I'm gonna focus on two that are, I think, Personally, I think they're just the best, uh, but I also think that they're the most relevant to the Northmen. And these are the Fornaldasagor, the legendary sagas, the sagas of old, and the Islendingasagor, the family sagas. The Fornaldasagor are much more fantastic. They're more heroic. They often feel more mythic, and they take place in this legendary history, kind of long ago and far away. They often take place on the continent and 
during the sort of uh, migration period in Germanic history. And they're full of these heroes that crop up, again, in Old English, in Old Norse, in Middle High German, sort of all over the Germanic-speaking world. And it's quite clear that Shonen Eggers had two Fornaldesagor mainly in mind. And these are the Vulsunga Saga, the Saga of the Volsungs, and Hrolf Saga Kraka, the Saga of Rolf Kraki. Both of these are widely accessible, very influential, and I think some of the best that the genre has to offer. To start though with Rolf Saga Kraki. To my mind, this saga is, alongside Saxo Grammaticus, the biggest inf influence on Eggers and Schoen. If they had a single saga in mind while writing The Northman, it is undoubtedly Rolf Saga Kraka. Rolf Saga is ostensibly about this legendary Danish king named Rolf Kraki, though in traditional saga fashion, the story begins about two generations before his birth. And it's really about this amazing feud between his ancestors. This man named Frothi kills his brother Haftan, who was the king of Denmark, to take the throne. And then Haftan's two children have to go on the warpath to take revenge against their uncle Frothi. Sound familiar? But then a generation or two later, we focus in on Hrolf Kraki, who is who becomes king. And even still, the saga isn't really about Hrolf himself, but really about his thanes. He has these 12 berserks who fight for him. And one of them is this man named Burvar Bjarki, who is a shapeshifter. I mean, as his name suggests, his name literally just means warlike little bear. Um, and his father is literally a bear. And there are just so many similarities between Borva Bjarki and Amleth. But what the saga does so well is explore the sort of perceived worldview of the berserks. And we really focus in on this, this group of berserks. But not only that, we get all of these depictions of magic, of the Seether, the kind of witch women, of the supernatural, of the connections between oath and and. and and warriors, the animalistic warrior rituals, almost all of this is in Hrolf's saga. It really indulges in this pagan past and really um, explores different forms of magic, the supernatural, the zerks, all of this. Highly recommend th th this saga. It's very, very good. And the next saga is, of course, Volsunga Saga. And Volsunga Saga is largely a story or multiple stories about revenge. I hope you're seeing a theme here. The, the medieval Icelanders were obsessed with the psychological and social uh, forces of, of feud and of revenge. Vilsunga Saga also engages with this sort of ancient Germanic past and has all of these supernatural elements. I mean, some of the characters are werewolves. We see Odin appear on a few different occasions and sort of guide the fates of man, as we see um, quite explicitly, I think, in The Northman with, with the ravens. I won't say too much more here about Volsunga Saga, as it deserves its own video or two or three, but it's quite good, and viewers of The Northman will note a ton of parallels between Volsunga Saga and The Northman, as well as Rosaga Kraka and The Northman. And there's also a dragon in uh, Volsunga Saga, which is pretty cool. We like to think that um, the medieval world was full of dragons and stuff, but in Germanic sources, we don't see it that often. We, there's only really a handful of dragons in the Old Norse sagas, and then of course there's um, one in Beowulf, but outside of that there really aren't that many dragons. But okay, moving on from the Fornöldr Sagur. Again, there are tons of other ones that are quite good. Um, I think those are probably the two best ones to start with um, for various reasons, but let's move on to some Islendinger Sagur. Now, the sagas of the Icelanders, again, it's important to remember, are a different genre. They take place in a more immediate history, and thus they're often much more uh, focused on realism than the Fornoldur Sagar, whereas the Fornoldur Sagar take place in this you know, history long ago and far away. Uh, the sagas of the Icelanders often take place in Norway and in Iceland, just a few hundred years before they're being written. And they're mainly about the settlement of Iceland and about all of the feuds that uh, took place around the settlement era. And the first two sagas I want to talk about are in this volume here put out by Penguin, um, which is really quite good. Um, and very accessible. They have a, there's a paperback copy that is very accessible online. And it really includes some of the best sagas, or at least the sagas that work so well as introductions. And in fact, the first saga I want to talk about is Gisli's Saga, um, which is a quite an early saga, um, but it works as a very good introduction to, to the genre. It's really a great outlaw saga, and we focus on this outlaw figure, Gisli. But we also focus on these larger feuds that occur between these blood brothers who break up and, well, 
everything goes downhill from there. It includes one of the best climactic battle scenes in all of the sagas for my money, and it includes one of the best uh, female characters. Um, Oithr, uh, Odd, uh, Gizli's wife, is very similar to Olga in a lot of ways. And it's quite short. I think it works as a pretty good introduction to the sagas, as it's quite short and very, very entertaining. The next saga is Ale Saga, or Egil Saga, depending which pronunciation, modern Icelandic or reconstructed Old Norse you're going with. Um, and this may well be my favorite saga. It's definitely in the top two. Ale Skatla Grimson is such a fantastic protagonist to follow, as he's this brutal warrior and who has a lot of these very animalistic qualities, but he's also this very emotional poet who, spe who speaks his emotions, which is very uncharacteristic for the sagas, in these gorgeous verses throughout the saga. We also have all of these berserks all over the place. I mean, um, Ael's grandfather, Kveldolf, which whose name just literally means night wolf, he's kind of a, a, a werewolf, um, is a berserk. Um, Ael's brother, Thorolf, is a berserk, and we witness him go berserk as he serves King Ethelstan in England. Um, and we see the repercussions of, of berserks and what sort of happens to them after the battle, after they've gone berserk. And Ael is also a rare follower of, of Othan, as is Amleth in the Northmen. And this is sort of rare for the sagas. Very few saga uh, protagonists like Othan, very, very few characters like Othan as he's well, he's kind of crazy. He's not very likable, like Thor is incredibly likable. But Ale Saga takes place over generations. It's epic in scope. It takes place all over Northern Europe. Um, it includes so many different feuds. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And again, Ale and Amleth um, would probably get along quite well. There's even a scene in Ale Saga where Ale rips the throat out of another man with his teeth, just like Amleth does in The Northman. But okay, I highly recommend this this volume. The translations in here are quite good, um, and the the choices of sagas in this um, are all are all wonderful. I highly recommend it. But I am also going to recommend um, Gretia Saga, which isn't in this volume, um, but is very well worth picking up. Gretia Saga is one of the very best uh, sagas, and it's probably the best outlaw saga, right up there with Gisli's saga. And Grettir is just another great anti-hero of the sagas. In case you haven't noticed, almost all of the heroes of the sagas are are anti-heroes, as they do some crazy things, and we're not and we're supposed to feel uncomfortable um, liking them. But Grettir's saga is very much interested in the psychology of the outlaw figure. And when I when I say outlaw here, I mean it in the legal sense. Medieval Iceland had a very convoluted um, very complicated um, legal structure in place. And one of the kind of primary sentences that the, the legal system could enforce was to outlaw people for various reasons. Usually if they killed someone, they could either get a lesser outlawry, which means they need to leave Iceland for three years, or they can get full outlawry, which means they're kicked off the island for life. And importantly, people can't harbor outlaws. If you harbor outlaws, then um, you're, well, you're in big trouble. And people can kill outlaws. If, if an outlaw chooses not to leave, they essentially have a, a bounty on their head and anyone can kill them. What's interesting about Grettir's saga is that he is this famous outlaw and the reason he's so famous is because he's the longest lasting outlaw in Icelandic history. He stayed in Iceland as an outlaw for almost 20 years. That is, he refuses to leave. But this means that he's constantly traveling throughout Iceland living in caves and, you know, in people's storehouses without them knowing. Um, and it's, he's very, uh, very isolated. And we actually get this very um, close psychological portrait of Grettir that we don't get in a lot of other sagas. This saga also includes a lot of supernatural elements. Um, Grettir fights um, a Droigur at one point, just like Amleth does. Well, he actually fights two different ones that we won't get into. He, he wrestles a bear um, in a scene that is very familiar if you read Beowulf. And, and Gretir Saga really is just one of the jewels of saga literature. I will say though that it, it is a very late saga. It was written much closer to 1400, um, which means that the author was actually a contemporary of Geoffrey Chaucer, which is insane to think about. But what this means, and the reason why I'm pointing this out, is that this saga is very reflective on the, the saga writing golden age. And so there's a lot of references to other sagas that you don't necessarily need to pick up on. 
um, uh, to appreciate the saga, but you will miss a lot in this saga if you read it before reading a bunch of the other family sagas. I'm also going to quickly throw out this um, edition of sagas put out by Penguin called Sagas of Warrior Poets, um, because this includes, I think, five different sagas, and they're all quite good. Yeah, it includes uh, a Cormac saga, saga of Halford Troublesome Poet, saga of Gunloig Ormstunga, uh, Serpent Tongue, saga of Bjorn Champion of the Hitterdal people, and Viglung Saga. And all of these sagas are interesting, and the reason why they're put in here as Sagas of Warrior Poets is that they focus on a, a warrior um, who is also a poet. And this is pretty common in a lot of the sagas. I mean, Grettir is a poet, Ale is a poet, Gisli is kind of a poet at times. But the reason I'm pointing out this collection here is not because these sagas are necessarily the best, though some of them are pretty good. I really like Halford Saga and, uh, and Gunlag Serpent Tongue Saga, for instance. But these sagas feel much more modern as they're focused very closely on individuals who are much more sympathetic. Um, a lot of the family sagas are what we would call regional sagas, and they encapsulate a character list that is hundreds long, and you have to keep all of these family trees. And while the sagas of the warrior poets have a ton of characters that you're going to have to figure out how to keep straight, they do focus in much more closely on on an individual character. And I think that a lot of modern readers find these to be a bit more readable than, say, some of the epic in scope family sagas like Njal Saga or Laxdella Saga or ones like that. But all right, that's enough of these sagas for now. I highly recommend these two collections, the Sagas of the Warrior Poets and the Sagas of the Icelanders. Though again, almost all of the family sagas are fantastic. Um, if you can find this, this, this box set that includes all, a, a translation of all of the family sagas, I'd highly recommend it, though it's prohibitively expensive and it's one of my prized possessions. And really quick, before moving on to um, some texts in Old English and uh, Middle English, I want to highlight, if you like the sort of historical nature of, of the Northman and how he's drawing from Saxo Grammaticus, this historian, I'd highly recommend checking out Snorri Sturluson's History of the Norwegian Kings, called Heimskringa, literally just Circle of the World. It's very similar in a lot of ways to Saxo's Gesta de Norum, though I actually find Snorri to be a more entertaining writer. Um, it's much more readable as well, in my opinion. Um, but they're both interested in, at least in the first half of both of their works, um, in the legendary history. Saxo of, of Denmark and Snorri, of course, of Norway. So the first saga in Heimskringla is uh, Inglinga Saga, which is, well, about the Ingling dynasty. But we get all of these, uh, these references to the gods um, uh, and, and this sort of legendary history that I won't really get into here. But um, it's, I mean, it's a massive work. It's like 900 pages in English. Um, but it's full of so many great stories, all of which, or not all of which, many of which I think rival the Amleth section of the Gesta Denorum. Okay, and moving on from Old Norse. The next one I want to recommend, it comes from Old English, and that is, of course, Beowulf. Now, I know if you've gone to an, an English-speaking school, an English-speaking high school or secondary school, um, you've probably read Beowulf. And I would encourage you, if you read it in high school, to read it again, especially if you think you didn't like it. Beowulf is a remarkably gorgeous poem full of linguistic wordplay and an exploration of so many different themes, one of which that I find to be the most interesting is the, the exploration of the connections, the similarities, and the differences between heroes and monsters, especially in the Germanic world. This is something that I think the Northmen explores quite a bit with Amleth's character, as well as the different berserks, um, and this explores beautifully with, with Beowulf, with Grendel, with Grendel's mother. But there are so many different feuds in Beowulf that, you know, you get the obvious ones, like the ones between Hrothgar and Grendel, and then later Hrothgar and Grendel's mother, which is all set up as a feud where, you know, they're talking about paying the, the wergeld, the man price, and all of this different stuff. But there's also all of these feuds in the background, some of which, if you've read Volsunga Saga, uh, you'll see connections to. Um, but Beowulf really is, I mean, it's, it's obvious, like everyone knows about Beowulf, but it's one, of those, it's one of those poems that I think a lot of people think they've read it, and they'll just kind of put it in the past, but I highly recommend checking it out again, because it really is 
well, it really is incredible. I'll, I'll stop there. I have, I think, three videos, all of which are about an hour long, where I go through and close read Beowulf. So go feel free to check that out. Um, I, I do it with Seamus Heaney's um, edition, as that one is a bit more popular, though. If you're interested, um, the edition that I always recommend, or the translation I always recommend, is Roy Louisa, which this is published by Broadview and quite accessible. Though the Seamus Heaney translation is fine. The last medieval source I want to talk about is a Middle English romance called Havelock the Dane. Now, medieval romances are great, right? They aren't about romances necessarily, though many are about what we what we call courtly love, this kind of form of love that um, became a thing in the 12th century. But they're called romances because they were originally written in Les Romans, in Old French. Medieval romances often engage a bit more with archetypes and with allegory than do the sagas. But there are so many great um, medieval romances written in Middle English, Old French, Old Norse, Middle High German, etc. They're, they're all over the place and they're worth checking out. And I think Havelock the Dane, which comes from the 13th century, and it's about 3,000 lines. It's almost as long as Beowulf. I think it's actually a pretty good place to start. It's about the heir to the Danish throne uh, named Havelock, who, as a baby, is disinherited as um, his father, the king, dies, and a retainer to the king seizes the throne and orders uh, all the king's children to be executed. See why it's relevant? <laughs> Havelock is a baby, but he is confiscated out of Denmark by this fisherman named Grimm, whose name, by the way, is a pseudonym for Othen in the Old Norse sources. Pretty interesting stuff. And Grimm has many um, Odinic personality traits. But anyways, uh, Grimm helps, helps Havelock escape Denmark, and the story then, you know, evolves and Havelock grows up and wants to take revenge and regain the throne. It's very worth reading. And this edition is actually free online, um, though this is written in Middle English and it's not translated, but it does include a sort of gloss on page. But just be warned that it is written in Middle English and will take a little bit more time, though I, I do think that, that most people can get through it. Um, relatively easily. But okay, cool. That's enough medieval sources for now. Again, if you want more, um, just let me know. I could talk about <laughs> medieval literature for days. Now I want to talk about some academic sources that are affordable, accessible, but still very good. If you know anything about um, academic writing, you know that you usually don't get those three things ever. Um, most of the good scholarship is insanely expensive and very difficult to find. And the stuff that is easy to find and affordable is usually pretty bad. So I picked out a few different texts that I think are relatively affordable, um, but still very, very good and have, you know, the academic rigor that I think is necessary when dealing with the Vikings. The first of which is a very large history of the Vikings by Neil Price called Children of Ash and Elm. This came out, I believe last year, maybe in 2020. This is basically the newest comprehensive examination of the Viking Age that brings together the newest research in archaeology, history, and literary studies and puts it all into one book. Neil Price is one of the leading scholars in the field, um, and, and this book is just wonderful and expansive and touches on pretty much everything. If you're looking for a big history of the Viking Age, don't go and read all of these, like, older history books from the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, that I read growing up. Um, just read Neil Price, and then you can go back to those ones later. Uh, but this is just really good scholarship um, and really deserves to be read. The next book I want to talk about is also very, very recent. I think this came out in 2020, um, though it might be 2021, um, called Valkyrie, The Women of the Viking World by Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdottir. Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdottir, just like Neil Price, was a consultant on the film The Northman. I probably should have mentioned that, that earlier. Um, and this book is just kind of a groundbreaking book on gender in the Viking Age. But um, Johanna is a, a, a more of a literary studies scholar than Neil Price. And so she's very much interested in the sagas themselves and in the depictions of, of women in the sagas. But this really is just a must read if you're interested in the sagas at all. Um, she's, again, one of the leading scholars in the field. Um, this book is, I think, relatively uh, affordable and accessible, and it's very, very good. The next book I want to mention has 
one of the worst covers I think I've ever seen. Um, but it's a very good book uh, by Tom Shippey, who wrote a very good biography of J.R.R. Tolkien, by the way, called The Author of the Century. Um, and Tom Shippey is obviously another very good academic. Um, I think he's at Oxford. Um, but this book is called Laughing Shall I Die, which takes its name from Ragnar Lothbrok's death song, Krakumal, the sayings of the raven, um, which the, the last line of, of that poem, which is a very interesting poem and a very good poem, you should read it, um, the last line of which is Layandi skolk deya, laughing shall I die. And what this book really does is try to explicate the the worldview and the ideologies of the Vikings. It explores the Viking mentality that is so foreign to us and that's so difficult um, for modern readers to really comprehend. But this book does such an excellent job of reading the literature and drawing from the literature um, the, the, this, this worldview. I remember the chapter specifically on, on A.L. Scala Grimson um, being particularly good, but there's chapters in here on Volsunga Saga, on Rosaga Kraka, on all of this different stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's very affordable, um, very accessible uh, to a modern audience. It's, you know, it's very academic, but it's still very, very accessible. Um, it's a great, great piece of scholarship that if you're interested in reading the sagas uh, and want to just understand the worldview of these, these people, um, I think you must read it. If you're interested in Norse paganism or the sort of religion of the Vikings, um, again, there is so much absolute garbage out there. Um, I'll recommend a few quick books here. The first of which is, I don't own a physical copy of because it's insanely expensive, um, but Neil Price's The Viking Way um, is very, very good if you can get your hands on it. If you can't, um, this book by Thomas A. Dubois, or Dubois, I'm not sure how he pronounces it, called Nordic Religions in the Viking Age is also extremely good. I think this came out in the late 90s, so it's a tad bit dated, but this looks at uh, archaeology primarily to reconstruct the, the Nordic religions of, of, of the Viking Age. It's relatively available in used copies online. And then really quick, the last book that I've got to take out um, that I'll recommend here is Christopher Abrams' Myths of the Pagan North, the Gods of the Northmen, which is very much... Um, a, a literary studies book in which he goes through the, the myths and the, the poetry of the Eddas and of skaldic verses, which we can date to the pre-conversion period, um, and just kind of reads them. And he does an exceptional job in this book, um, and I highly recommend it. And lastly, if you're interested in the Icelandic sagas, you'll need to, at some point, figure out the, the, the legal workings of medieval Iceland, and primarily the primarily how feud works in this world. And so to do that, I highly recommend these two books, um, Feud in the Icelandic Sagas by Jesse Bayok. Jesse Bayok is a great archeologist and he actually has other books that are also pretty accessible. Um, Viking Age Iceland and Medieval Iceland Society Sagas uh, and Power. Um, Viking Age Iceland specifically is actually quite good as well. Um, but we often think of feuds as physical affairs, right? Of men wielding axes and swords and killing each other. But what we really need to reckon with, if you want to get into the sagas, is the legal apparatus around feuds. And that many of the most famous saga uh, characters are lawyers, not warriors. We see this in, um, in Brannu Njal's saga, where Njal isn't a warrior in the saga. We never see him pick up a sword. He is a lawyer. And so Feud by Jesse Bayok is very good and kind of explains how this works. And then I also want to quickly mention um, Blood Taking and Peacemaking, Feud, Law, and Society in Saga Iceland by William Ian Miller. Miller is actually a lawyer by training. Um, and he writes, he has a couple different books on the sagas. Um, but he reads the, the sagas through this legal framework. Um, and, this, and this book in particular has a ton of just really great readings of the sagas. Um, but really just focuses on the legal aspect of feud. He also has another great book that um, is expensive that is just a reading of Nyal Saga called Why Is Your Axe Bloody? But so that should be enough to keep you busy, I'd say. Um, the last recommendation I want to make, um, because that's all medieval stuff um, and, and scholarship, which is all great, but I also want to draw your attention, if you're not familiar with him, to Schoen, who is the co-writer of The Northmen. Um, he is a fantastic modern writer who writes a lot of really great books, many of which I've done reviews on, so if you want to check them out, 
um, you can do it that way. So there are plenty of other books, primary sources and secondary sources to talk about. And I'm happy to talk more about them um, if anyone happen to be interested in them. Um, I think this is a pretty good place to start, though, if you're interested in any of the books behind me, um, most of which uh, are essential to understanding the, the medieval world that I love to study, um, go check out my bookshelf tour where I, I go through all of these shelves and talk about a lot of the books that I think are important. So I hope the Northman encourages more people to go back and, and read the original sources. I think the sagas are just a, an absolute gem of world literature that I think a lot of modern readers will like. I think there are a few points of friction that you need to get past. I think the names are difficult if you're not familiar with uh, Icelandic names, and the amount of characters is often difficult. You will have to make family trees um, depending which sagas you choose to read. But I think past that, I think they're very readable and a hell of a lot of fun. So I hope I've encouraged at least someone to pick up a saga and try to read it, because I think you'll like what you find. Anyways, for now, thanks for watching.